today I have come with an admonition and some really good news. Pastor, thank you for this opportunity. Pastor Linda. Thank you to all of you who have been praying for me. I felt your prayers. Um, and thank you to those of you who reached out and told me that you were praying for me. That really helps when you're preparing uh, an admonition. <laughs> so I'm going to just open in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this day, this opportunity to gather together in your presence. God, thank you for this word. God, let us all be changed by it, Lord. Every single part of this word, let us be changed by it, God to be able to go forward into the second half of this year, the second half of this vision, God. God, I pray that I am not in the way, but you would be able to flow through me a vessel, Lord, for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to start out in the parable of the talents. So that's in Matthew 25. And before I get there, just as a quick reminder, there was a, a man he had some servants, he called them to him, he gave them talents, pieces of money, then he went on a long journey. They were then responsible for that, his money while he was on the journey. However, they were also servants, so I'm sure that they had some other jobs that they needed to do during that time. So it wasn't just all about the money, it was about they had to do everything while he was gone. And then he comes back, and some of the servants did a good job, and one did not. So we're going to start in verse 19 of Matthew 25. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So they had many other tasks to do, but he came and reckoned with them about the money. What had they done with his resources? They weren't judged faithful or unfaithful on the things they were expected to have done. They were judged faithful or unfaithful based on their stewardship of his resources. So remember, stewardship means managing resources that belong to someone else. So we'll go to 1 Corinthians 6.20. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So you belong to God, so everything you do is stewardship. Every single thing you do is stewardship if you belong to God, which this verse says, you belong to God. So you are every day, every moment managing resources that belong to someone else. And to be faithful, to be called faithful, you have to be faithful. He's not going to call anybody a good and faithful servant who has been slothful, who hasn't been managing the resources he's given them the way he wants them managed. So the word faithful means trustworthy, remaining loyal, and steadfast. It also means true to one's word, promises, and vows. So your faithfulness to God in the context of stewardship is more than just coming to church. That is what's expected of you. It's the fourth commandment. You just keep it. You just come to church. That's not where you're going to be judged faithful. That's not being a steward. That's what you're expected to do. So your faithfulness to God comes in times when no one else would know. No one else is there to judge your faithfulness. It's just God. No one else is going to know if you skip your Bible reading for that day. No one else is going to know if you, I don't know, keep putting off your doctor's appointment that you have coming up that's really important for you to go to. 
No one's going to know if you cut your prayer short just a little bit today because you have so much to do. Your faithfulness to God comes in those times when no one else is going to know but God. It's also in our thoughts. We can be faithful to God right up here or unfaithful. No one else is going to know what you think. If you're going through something and you just start to think, is God really going to come through this time? Is there, it's, I mean, I know he's healed me before, but it, maybe he doesn't want to heal me this time? That's unfaithfulness. Because he's the healer of every single one of our diseases. He is faithful. And his faithfulness is not determined on whether or not he comes through on what you want. That has been a very difficult lesson to learn. That he does not become less faithful because you did not get what you wanted. We need to be faithful stewards of everything that God has given us. And what he specifically spoke to me about is our perspective. The way we view situations, the way we view what's going on around us, the way we view even each other. So perspective is a particular attitude towards or way of thinking about something. It's a point of view. So today I'm here to talk to you about the faithfulness perspective. The faithfulness perspective says, I know in whom I have believed. So I'm on the Lord's side no matter what. No matter what it looks like, what it sounds like, whatever, whatever's going on with someone else, with me, I'm on the Lord's side. So the faithfulness perspective can see, be seen in lots of different areas of Scripture. We'll go to Daniel chapter 3, verse 17. So this is just a call back to Wednesday. If you were here, it was an amazing Bible study. If not, please listen to it so this part makes sense. So as a background, this is about the three Hebrew boys that were about to be thrown into the fire. They said they believed their God. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So they had the faithfulness perspective. They knew God was going to come through. He could come through. But even if he didn't, even if it was his will for them to be burned up in that furnace, they weren't going to serve another God. They weren't going to turn around. They weren't going to change their minds. They had the faithfulness perspective. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Starting in verse 7. I seem to have given the wrong scripture. So I'll just give a recap. So this is Paul and the thorn. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. He prayed three times. Three times. And God said, no, you're going to keep that. You're going to keep the thorn. Because it's good for you. And so Paul said, I glory in my infirmities. Thank you for the opportunity to be in this position. You're not going to heal me of this? That's fine. I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to do what you've called me to do. And he gloried in his infirmities. He didn't just say, okay, this is how it's going to be. We're guilty of that. Sometimes when God doesn't come through the way we want him to come through, we're just like, all right, well, this is how it's going to be. This is how the rest of my life goes. But Paul said, I glory in my infirmities. Thank you, Jesus, for this that you've given me, this opportunity you've given me. That's the faithfulness perspective. Now we're going to talk about Job. Job had the faithfulness perspective. 
in chapter 1, he lost everything. Everything he had except his wife. He lost all of his animals. He lost his children. He lost everything. And here's what he said in Job chapter 1, verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. As soon as he found out he lost everything, he worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. And the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He lost everything, and his answer was, I, I didn't have anything when I came in. I'm not going to have anything when I go out. I'm, gonna, I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to bless your name. And then God allowed him to be touched in his body in chapter 2. After all of that, he lost everything, and then he got real sick. Then we see his response in chapter 2, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still remain, retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. His wife went through the exact same tragedy that he did. She went through the, all the same things. She lost everything too, and all of her children. But this was her perspective. Why don't you just curse God and die? Just end it now. That was her perspective. Then for his perspective, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall not receive evil? And in all this did not Job sin with his lips. He had the faithfulness perspective. And later in verse 13, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He had the perspective that it, I lost everything. He lost his livelihood. He lost his family. And his wife basically told him, give up. Get, just give up. But he said, I'm still going to serve God. I'm still going to press towards the mark. I'm still going to bless God because he's still good no matter what has happened. He's still good. It doesn't matter what's happened. He's still good because that's who he is. Faithful is who he is. What happens doesn't change that. Getting sick does not mean he's not the healer. How could he heal if you never got sick? How could he deliver if you didn't need deliverance? He gives us these opportunities, these situations for us to learn who he is. We wouldn't know. We wouldn't know if he didn't give us these opportunities. Because we could read the book, yeah. He was their healer. He was their deliverer. He was their provider. But it doesn't mean anything unless he's your provider. It doesn't mean anything unless he's your healer. We need to accept the opportunities he's laid in front of us. The opportunities for us to know him as our comforter as our peace. We need to be in the middle of the storm to know that he is the peace. We need to change our perspective today and not say, why me? Why is God allowing this in my life? But no, our perspective, we need to see it through faithfulness. We need to see it through, I know I know in whom I have believed. And even if he doesn't answer the way I want him to answer, it doesn't change who he is. He's never going to stop being faithful. He's never going to stop being the answer. Just because we're confused in this moment. When we have the faithfulness perspective, we trust God no matter the outcome. We don't try to solve it ourselves. We seek his guidance. If you trust him to be the light unto your path, you're not carrying a backup flashlight. You're not saying, okay, 
I'm going to trust you until you don't answer the way I want it. So I'm going to just, I'm going to light my own path now. Because I guarantee if you pull out that backup flashlight, you're going to be really confused because you're going to see a whole bunch of different paths. And not a single one of them is going to be the one God called you to walk down. When I was preparing for this message and God spoke that to me, he showed me just a picture of just an instance of someone turning on a flashlight and the path that he was leading them down disappearing and all these other paths showing up. But not a single one of them led the way the other one was leading. We need the faithfulness perspective today. His faithfulness isn't contingent upon the way he answers prayers. Will you still say he's faithful if the miracle never comes? Are you still faithful to God in disappointment and sorrow and mourning? Are you still faithful to God when he allows situations in your life? The faithfulness perspective allows us to keep pressing toward the mark when we're walking through the fire. Because sometimes our path has us walk through the fire. But we need to keep pressing towards the mark and not sitting down in the middle of the fire feeling sorry for ourselves. That's not what God allowed that to happen for you to do. He didn't say, you know what, I'm going to give them this really difficult thing going on just so they'll sit down and get burned up. No. Because God called you for such a time as this, for such a place as this, and he's given you these opportunities to show you who he is, to prepare yourself to be the bride. And because the path that we walk is leading to eternity. The prize that we're pressing for is to be the bride. There's nothing in this world that can compare to that prize that we're pressing for. So if I have to press through the fire, I'm going to press through the fire. If I have to crawl through the mud, I'm crawling through the mud. Because God has, is the light unto my path. He's taking me somewhere. And that place I need to go, oh, I need, I need that. I need that more than anything. I need to get where he's calling me, where he's taking me. Because I haven't gone through everything I've gone through to give up here. You have not gone through everything you've gone through to give up here. This is not the place to give up. Until you are at the end and you are at the throne with him, you're not done. You don't get to sit down and give up. You're not done. We need to change our perspective today. Our perspective needs to be changed by the renewing of our minds. It's not something we can do by ourselves, but we need Jesus to do it. When we view our situations in the flesh, we can't see what we know is true. We're looking at it through our fleshly eyes, and we can only see the ways that we can see. We go into fixer mode, and we want to fix it. We want to change. We want to move things around and fix it ourselves. But that's not the faithfulness perspective. The faithfulness perspective says it doesn't have to look good for me to know that it's going to be worked out for my good. It doesn't have to look good yet because my perspective has been changed. I am seeing it through the faithfulness perspective. It looks like I'm going this way, but I know God's going to turn me. I'm going down this path. I'm not really sure where this is going to lead, but God's got to bend. It look, might look bad right now. It might look like there's not an answer right now. Howard, it might look like there's no answer right now or the answer's really scary, but God's got a bend. You're coming for a bend. We need to change our perspective today. We need the faithfulness perspective. So now I have a few steps for how to get the faithfulness perspective. So we can start walking in the faithfulness perspective today. So number one, we're going to take down our own perspective. Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Surrender your thoughts to God. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. 
casting down imaginations, those are in your head, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. So today, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to tear down your old perspective. You're going to take every thought into captivity to the knowledge of Christ. After that, you're going to cast your cares. 1 Peter 5 and 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He's going to carry that for you. Because worrying about it is going to do nothing good for you. It's going to lead you back, right back to your perspective. So after you've teared, torn down your, your own perspective, now you've got to take all those cares, all those things, cast them to God. He's going to take care of that for you. You don't have to carry it. You don't have to care. He cares. Easier said than done, but I'm giving you steps. Number three, you're going to establish your new perspective. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let God renew your mind today. Once he's renewed your mind, you have some things you need to think about to replace that cavity of those worries. So we're going to go to Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So you're going to replace all those worries about your situations, about your health, about whatever promise you're holding on to God for. You're going to replace them with what's true. Jesus is true. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Think on Jesus. He's what's true. Whatsoever things are honest, don't believe the lies. Even the lies you were telling yourself, you got rid of those. Whatsoever things are just, pure, lovely, of a good report. Don't listen to those bad reports. The enemy will come in and he will tell you some bad reports. Or he'll take your report, whatever report that you got, and make it sound real scary. But we're going to think on the good report. The good report is that God is the healer. He's the provider. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's going to provide whatever it is that you have need of. That's the good report. He's the way, the truth, the life. He is what we think on. And then after you've done those three things, you've turned your, take down your own old perspective. You've, take that down. You've cast your cares onto him. You've established your new perspective and replaced those old thoughts. Now you're going to commit. You're going to commit to it. Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. After you've done all of that, now you're going to commit. It's time to commit. So today, the good news is that you have the opportunity to start walking in the faithfulness perspective. So remember those steps. Number one, you're going to take down your old perspective. Tear it down. Number two, you're going to cast your cares unto God. Every last one of them. Don't leave any cares. Cast them all unto God. Number three, you're going to establish your new perspective. And you're going to replace those thoughts. And then number four, you're going to commit. Commit thy works. That's everything you do. Remember, you belong to God. Everything you do is stewardship. So commit your stewardship of yourself to God and your thoughts will be established in the faithfulness perspective. We needed a course correction today to be able to go into the second half of this year. So I came to ring the alarm that we need to walk in the faithfulness perspective through the rest of this year. To be able to accomplish what God has set before us, 
We need to walk in this perspective. I know the, the Lord has given me a word to preach today because I realized this morning of how intensely I've been fought. I didn't realize it till this morning when I, until I was finishing things up. I was like, oh, well, that makes so much more sense. <laughs> now I know what's going on, and the Lord has come to speak. And I, Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. God, I thank you. I thank you for the word that's already been preached. God, let it dwell within us, God, and let not the thorns quench the word today, God. But, Lord, let more word that you've come to give, let it fall on good ground, God. Lord, speak through me today in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was preparing for this, I think I was preparing for one message, and then the Lord led me down a path to this message. So I have another one that's kind of unfinished studying. I'm going to work on that one a little bit, see what comes of it. But the passage that he brought to my mind and the subject he was having me study was on the phrase, all things. And the verse that he brought me to, which we, one of the many ones that pops into our heads when we hear the words, all things, is Philippians 4.13. This is the faithfulness perspective. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That is a declaration today. And that is during all times, not just the convenient times, not the happy times, not the mountaintop experience times, but I could do all things. That means when I'm walking through the valley, when I'm surrounded by enemy lines, that means when I'm full of questions and full of doubts, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He's the one that gives us strength. We, we love to try to muster up our own strength. We love to try to, I can handle this on my own. I have it all figured out. I got my backup flashlight, so I got everything worked out. But it's through him where we have true strength. Without him, we're just making a bigger mess of things. And so he had me sticking with all things, obviously, and that he also just highlighted strengthening. And it brought me back to a verse that we've studied, we've ripped apart, and we've digested it in years past. But it's Nehemiah 8.10 at the end of the verse. Neither be ye sorry. That means vexed, perplexed, upset. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that word joy here in the Hebrew actually means rejoicing. I used to have this perspective, rejoicing was constantly, just all the time, praising God, hands lifted high. Yes, you could do that. Yes, you could praise God. Yes, you could pray. But I just thought I was just making a show of it at all times. Always, you know, it's kind of hard at work to just stand around praising God and, and making a fool of yourself like that. But that's not what rejoicing is. Rejoicing means to have joy or delight in the Lord. It's not a performance. It's a command because it says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. But it's also a choice that we have to make. A conscious decision to carry the joy of the Lord. To rejoice in all times. During the hard times. During the easy times. During the times where you have no way where the Lord is leading you. It's a conscious decision to say, I will rejoice because I know what he's brought me through. I know what he's done in the past. I know who he is. And I know where he's taking me even though I can't see it in front of me. It is a choice to rejoice. And that's the name of the message today, the choice to rejoice. The enemy's been in our face lately. Lots of distraction going on. Sometimes the distractions are things that, that can be blessings, like a birthday party for your daughter. <laughs> But the enemy can come in and distract you with things during that time of celebration. He likes to be in your face, especially when he feels the ripple effects of what God is doing in your life. Especially when he feels in the spiritual realm the things that God has planned for you. Especially when he becomes scared. He likes to be in your face. And when I was growing up, Whenever my little sister, that reverend back there, 
whenever she would just get on my nerves, just doing whatever that she was doing, I would try to reach to my parents and say, she's driving me crazy. Do something. And they would say, ignore her. That used to get me so mad. <laughs> that is not what I wanted. I wanted you to do something to get her to stop. And so my response to her was, I'm ignoring you. That's not truly ignoring because you're still acknowledging what is happening. Um, true ignoring is putting your focus on something else. When the enemy is in your face distracting you and annoying you and whispering little lies in your face, turning around to him saying, I'm ignoring you, is not true ignoring him. But focus on God. Make that choice to rejoice while he's in your face. Get in his face and rejoice because God is faithful, because he has every problem in the palm of your hand, because he has the answer right before you when he's in your face just driving you crazy get in his face and say I praise God anyway I will rejoice and be glad in it I choose to have joy because that's where my strength comes from my strength comes from the joy of the Lord you can throw everything that you can at me but I choose to rejoice today if the enemy is in your face today, focus on the face of God. Focus on the one who has everything planned out. You know those situations the enemy comes to throw at you? God allowed you to have that situation. So focus on him anyway because it wouldn't be happening without his stamp of approval. Give him the praise and the honor and the glory because he's the one that will pull you through no matter how you may feel, no matter how you may think no matter what your bank account looks like no matter what your blood work report looks like rejoice in the face of the one who's trying to distract you today make the choice to rejoice today the word strength in this passage it means a fortified place it's a defense a fortress rejoicing in the lord is your defense today church Make a choice to use that defense that he's given you in your hand and rejoice in him in the face of adversity today. Philippians 4.4 Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I've learned through my studying of the word and going through Bible college when something's repeated he's trying to make a point and it's serious rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice again I say rejoice the word rejoice means calmly happy in this verse Kind of sounds a little bit like calm delight, doesn't it? it sounds very familiar. This Greek uh, word is also used as a salutation when somebody's coming in or when they're leaving. I want to be so full of rejoicing that when I enter a room, rejoicing follows with and it becomes addictive. It flows over into the next one. And then when you leave the room, uh, rejoicing should stay with them and they should take it with them. Rejoicing should be an attitude choice, something that we step into, not just say, oh, it's just a word in the Bible and a song that we praise and that we use when we sing, but it is an attitude adjustment. When you have the faithfulness perspective that Sister Jasmine talked about, you also should be carrying the choice to rejoice. That attitude adjustment when you're walking through the valley. The word says that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's getting in the face of the enemy and saying, you can do whatever you want, but I will not fear. I will be joyful. I will rejoice in him because he's the one that provides strength. The word always, it means at all times. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says there's a time for everything. A time to weep, a time to dance, a time to bury, a time to be born. It doesn't just cover all the good things. It covers all the bad things, too. Rejoice at all times. 
is what the author is saying to us. Recently, we heard a message about our race and how it is specifically crafted for us. And sometimes our race involves fire and it involves flood. Isaiah 43 and 2. When thou passest through. I love that word through because it's a spoiler alert. It means there's an end to the other side. It doesn't go on and on forever. You're not going to drown. There's an end to it. You just got to go through it. Don't stop is one thing that we've learned through this passage. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. The one who gives you strength. The one who gives you peace. The one who gives you answers and comfort. He says, I will be with thee. And when through the rivers... He didn't say ocean. He's not going to leave you out there to drown. He's not going to place you somewhere where you're not on solid ground. He's not going to let you doggy paddle in the middle of nowhere. It's through the river. There's another side of the river. Sometimes we're going through it, and we think this is never ending. He didn't put you in the middle of the ocean by yourself. He said, when you pass through the rivers, they will not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame be kindled upon me. Through this passage, we've learned not to stop is the first thing. You stop, and that's where the catastrophe takes place. And then the second thing is, is when you're walking through the fire, be on fire while you're going through the fire. Be on fire of the Holy Ghost. Be on fire for God. Be on fire with that joy of the Holy Ghost. Be on fire with the strength. When I was reading this passage and the Lord spoke that to me, I was like, I want to be so on fire for God that when I'm walking through the flames of the trial, I don't even notice them anymore. All I see is the fire of God. I don't see the fire of the trial. I just see the fire of God. You fight that fire with fire and carry that joy and that peace with you. In our church, we always quote the scripture, having done all to stand, stand. We're really good at that. We're good at standing. We've put that scripture on. We've come in our place. We've been there with every mindset, but we're standing there, some of us, and feeling weak. Because we've forgotten about the joy that is our strength. We've forgotten to rejoice while we're standing there. We've forgotten to be thankful for what he's done for us in the past. The situation we may be going through now may be burdensome. But have you remembered the other situations that he's brought you through before? This isn't God's first rodeo. He will bring you through it. He is faithful. And he's not going to let you out there to drown. When you walk through through the fire and the flood. He is with thee. Some of us are feeling weak today in the fire and the flood. Too many things going on. I'm still in my place though, but I'm buckling under the weight of everything that's going on. And God is saying, because you've forgotten about the joy. We learned about joy. It's burned upon our hearts from the year of 2019, the year of the PJs. It's burned upon us, but we're about four years away from that theme, guys. Can you believe it? And he's saying you forgot about the preeminent joy. You forgot about the prevailing, the pervasive joy. We should just go ahead and take it on and make it predominant joy, that we carry it with us, that it's the only thing that evades from us is joy so that it splashes on to everybody else. Uh, Carry that joy while you're standing. Carry that joy through the flood and the fire. That is where your strength comes from. The joy of the Lord is your strength. There's another man in the Bible that I thought Jasmine was going to talk about, so I'm glad she didn't, so that I can talk about him. (laughs) Brother Joseph. He had everything that you could think of thrown at him, just like Job, but a a different kind of way. He was sold into slavery by his very family. Then after that, he was thrown in jail. Then after that, he was accused of adultery with the Pharaoh's wife of all people. 
and thrown into jail again. But you know what? He continued to carry that choice of rejoice because while he was still in the jail cell with others, he was still ministering and working for God while he was in there. He didn't stop and say, oh, woe is me. My life is horrible. I can't take this anymore. He was still working for God in the jail cell. He was still carrying that choice to rejoice. He was still carrying the strength that he needed to go through. And then eventually, God lifted him up into a place. God used him in a great and mighty way. What you do in the jail cell determines what's going to happen to you later. Joseph could have stayed in that jail cell. He could have stayed and complained and, and murmured the whole time he was there. But he probably would have not ended up where God left him to be. Not only did he get set on a place of power, he also, his relationships with his very family that sold him into slavery got mended. I guarantee you what you do in the jail cell and the choices that you make in the jail cell determine what happens later down the road. What happens? Put on the faithful this perspective today church what you're going through and how you respond to what you're going through determines what's going to happen down the road here's Joseph's response in Genesis 50 20 end of the book but as for you he's talking to his brothers ye thought evil against me but God but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass. Everything was guided by God, even though it was the worst possible thing that I think could ever happen to me. But God meant it to good and to pass, as it is this day to say much people alive. Not only did God use Joseph for his benefit, but he used Joseph for the benefit of others. So that way they could be fed. So that way they can continue living in the time of famine. It just wasn't just for Joseph. Joseph's benefit, but it was for the benefit of those that were under him. If you feel in the jail cell, in the fire, in the flame, put on the faithfulness perspective and the choice to rejoice. It's not just a one and done thing. It is an everyday occurrence. When the enemy throws something at you and he's in your face, you can get in his face and remind him that everything works out for your good. No matter what he throws at you and how he throws it at you, get back in his face and remind him of who you are and whose you are today. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice evermore. Evermore. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. In everything, everything, not just the good times, not when you're on the mountaintop, not when you come home from conference and you're on fire, not just then, but it's when you've been away from that mountaintop for a long time and you haven't felt God move in a while in your life, in your home, in your family. Everything give thanks for this is the will of God. That's his will, church. In everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Jesus Christ concerning you. Not just anybody, but it's personal. This is the will of God concerning you. He's pointing you in the face today. Psalm 34, or 32, 11, rather. The psalmist David, he wrote this passage. <clears throat> My soul... It is 3211. I could read it right here. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. We know this song. We've heard it before. I've sang it as a child. We've sang it here. But the Lord shed some light upon this. First of all, the word rejoice here is a different Hebrew word. And it means to spin around. Rejoice in the Lord. Put some crazy praise on your situation. And you know with that crazy praise, you don't have to feel it to do it. Just put some crazy praise on that situation. 
situation. Spin round in that jail cell. Spin around in that flame and that fire. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy. That means to emit stridulous sound. I'm here to tell you today, if you need some joy, put something on the sound waves in order to receive that joy. Put it on the sound waves that you need joy. Woo! Put it on the sound waves, church. If you need some joy right now, put it on the sound waves today. Hallelujah. Ooh, hallelujah. Ooh. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Joy is not just sitting pretty and asking, God, I need some joy. Sometimes getting joy looks a little bit ugly. Sometimes needing joy gets a little loud. It's not just sitting prim and proper waiting for it to fall in your lap. Sometimes it revolves around being a little bit crazy what you need. He promises to give it to you. It's what you do about it. God's promises are if you do this, I'm going to do this. But you have to do the this part in order to get the this that he's promising you. And also when I was reading this passage, it, he's not talking to just anybody. Because he says, ye righteous and all that are upright in heart. Not everybody in the church today fits those qualifications, church. He's not talking to just anybody. He's talking to his chosen ones that need that joy, that need that strength. He's pointing the finger at you today, saying, be glad and rejoice, ye righteous, not just anybody. Shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart, not those that are standing in wickedness just waiting for the joy to come. Um, I'll tell you what, those that are standing in wickedness sure ain't going to make it ugly. They're not going to ask for joy in an ugly way. Sometimes when you need something of God, sometimes it's not pretty. Jesus said this in John 15. It's in the context of the vine passages where Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Abide in me and I will abide in thee. You could go ahead back and read that. But John 15, 11, this is what he's saying in that context. He's talking about being the vine and the branches. And he says, these things that I have spoken unto you, that my joy, in the red letters, might remain in you. Plug yourself into the joy. That's where your strength comes from. It's from him. By abiding in him, by immersing yourself in the word, by immersing yourself in praise in his presence, not just sloughing it off when you're going through a trial. It's abiding in him. And then he says that his, his joy will remain in you and that your joy may be full. When you're plugged into the source like that, you're never going to run out of a joy supply. You're never going to run out of a, 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 a rejoicing supply or a strength supply because you're plugged into him and you're abiding in him we learned about his faith working in us his joy also works in you if you're plugged into him if you're abiding under the shadow of the almighty his joy his strength abides in you but you have to make the choice church Brother Nathan. another all things passage to end this scripture and this message this is why we can rejoice Romans 8 28 
This is why we can rejoice. And we know, not think, not perceive, we know that all things, all things, not just some things, not a portion of the things, but all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. This is why we rejoice today. This is why we choose to rejoice. I'm a witness of knowing that all things work together for good. Sometimes we just forget about it sometimes especially in the midst of the trial. We come out, we love this passage, and we love the count it all joy passage when we're out of it. But we're in, in it. We forget about it. But this is why we choose to rejoice, church. Here's a passage the Lord has laid upon my heart as a preemptive declare each and every day, not just when Sister Kathy comes and gives the announcements. It's Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the, which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Stand today, church. God is pouring out a refreshing of joy and strength in this place. And you have a choice whether you're going to step into it or if you're just going to ignore it and move on. My suggestion is step into that joy and strength because something may be down the road that you need that extra strength to get through. So plug into the source today where the strength comes from. Make the choice today, church.